uh, critiquing capital and capital's viewpoint that I've seen at various points in the last seven months are those who would say the rich are not paying their fair share. Guess what? The rich don't have a fair share. Labor creates. So when we say tax the rich, who's we? It's their state. I don't know. In other words, it is a moralistic critique. It is recognizing that in a certain in a certain sense the rich are not paying. But I don't believe the rich have a fair share. There's also um, the shareholders act that if you kind of work your way, play nice, you can get enough shareholders in a company to not exploit their workers, to not engage environmentally disruptive practices, or to say, you can get rid of corporate greed and still have capitalism. And I'm not really sure how a system based on exploitation, on accumulation of profit at any cost that's actually possible. I think that's actually quite utopian. And then there are those who want various progressive reforms, maybe even socialist reforms, but we need to support Elizabeth Warren, we need to support Barack Obama or the Democrat Party, but we need to hold their feet to the fire. And I'm not quite sure how that's, I don't believe that's actually worked at all. Now, I believe all these positions lack an understanding of the actual functions or institutions that they critique. I believe they are making critique. I believe at times they make some good points, but I don't believe they understand the actual system. And again, they end up making a moralistic appeal to the system, or demands on that system, if you want to put demands as a moralistic critique for those in power to behave. And those demands are often expressed in rather non-threatening or accommodating ways to the system. You know, so making things a little better, or in the hopes of maybe incrementally leading to that better society. But I want to conclude now, because I've talked for long enough, and pretty much say that when Sartre, or Mazar's critique of Sartre, is that what we, and what we need to do in Occupy is to get past the purely moralistic critique of capital, to get past critiquing capital within its vantage point. We're coming up with demands that the system can play nice. We need to understand those social structures on which the system base, and the larger capitalist system as the target Great. Well, uh, now we're, we're at the point where we have uh, an hour. We have this room for another hour, so uh, we can use that time for a discussion. Any, and so, if you have something you want to comment on or questions or whatever, this is the moment. So, uh, we're opening it up to your turn. I have to get rid of something. And a lot of English background, you know, German, or European. And I mean, the size is, is, the size is too severe. He was not trying really to be a politician. It's a difference between politics and existential philosophy. You can get a common set there, you know, but the point is here, what he did in the 50s, he developed. Another type of man, which is the anti hero. The anti hero, of course, that's why he's an anti, is at the end fault for his actions. But his actions are not trying to explore what is outside the boundaries, of the defined boundaries of one's existence in, in that society, or in our society. We, we, we went 50 years and forgot all of that. So, what he's doing basically is allowing individuals to play a negative role, which is imposed on them by a situation or by the existence they have. So like one known Seattle play, uh, the, the Communist Party orders the killing of one of its leaders. So the man who has to do this has uh, obviously an awful job to do, and he struggles and does more into it, but yet he still good, does it. Why? Comes an infant hero who takes this job in his own way and does something on purpose bad. Why? He, he wants to be at the end basically his own tragic character. He suffers for that. The whole thing is to question the system at the end. But the individual on purpose does something which goes beyond the limits of, of normality. Uh, it's basically an exploration of the possibilities of one's existence. And we know that this is all not about even saying what he's saying. So, so basically, because we have.
have so many boundaries here. So, so that this is not a political thinking, it's very clear. He, he then, of course, supported uh, what was in his mind the most possible progressive way of political action. But he was always against the uh, uh, populism of like Communist Party. Is that dirty hands are you referring yeah, to? Yeah. Listen, I'm not going to deny this. I think Sartre's a fantastic person to read. Yeah, no, I just want to criticize oh, yeah. saying it was a bit too severe to, to criticize a, a thinker who was dealing with existence. <laughs> I'm actually just recapitulating what Mazar said on that. And it's, it was actually, for me, it was actually a very powerful critique because. Um, Originally, before I actually read that, I really thought that there might have been a way to fuse existentialism and Marxism. I do, but after kind of reading that, I, I kind of uh, I kind of accepted what Mazaros was saying on that point. And Mazaros, the political uh, thinking, which, which is not really the same as the philosophical one, you know, it's here. Uh, yeah, it's a common set here, but it's not the same. It goes different ways. It's not, it's not an identity. <laughs> You're right, and you know something else that's kind of interesting to note about Sartre is um, he, he's very. I think the one thing that's actually consistent about him is his inconsistency, and he kind of recognizes that throughout his life because he'll say different things about different topics at various times, and you know, and he recognized like at one point, you know, he acts very good for all, like he wouldn't get involved. French popular front, or really wasn't excited about the Spanish Civil War or whatnot. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Mazaros actually met Sartre. Oh, okay, she did. Sure. And Mazaros has a great and enduring respect for Sartre. And um, Mazaros is actually a um, full critique of Sartre. It's coming out in like two months, so it's like I don't have access to like the full thing to maybe flesh my out more. But it is coming out in two months. I agree. I just it's the difference between someone who's uh, mostly involved with uh, another way of exploring life and someone who's actually more in the political area. And it's right. unquestionably impossible to match both. Uh, you know, science is supported all the possible uh, progressive uh, movements. He, he really experimented in all of them. He did very well. Yeah, yeah. Amazing oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah, I think in, in Saros's point, and, and Doug raised it, is that, that uh, what was key or, or feature of, of Sartre's work was that he criticized the bourgeois from inside, which was very powerful, but at the same time was limiting. And uh, Saros has the wonderful work, uh, The Works of Sartre, Volume 1 was published earlier, Volume 2 is going to come out as Doug said in a couple of months, so, uh, you know, it's also very close to Sartre in the mid-50s. I have a lot of criticism points to Sartre. The one I, I remember was uh, from Adorno, the German philosopher. He was uh, calling Sartre, where he, he was uh, characterizing Sartre's philosophy as a late for a new form of Christianity, which has some tools to it. But it is the romantic face of existentialism and Sartre and Carl uh, Jaspers are certainly very joyful uh, romantic thinkers. You could criticize a lot in what they wrote, but it's, it's their own personality. Very strong and powerful. Oh, sorry, it inspires me greatly. I mean, whatever else, and I, I hope I did emphasize this point, is he really strove to practice what he preached. Whether it was in the 50s, 60s, or whenever, he really was trying to engage in the struggle for freedom. And yeah, what happens nowadays, which is a lot more worse than uh, this type of criticism from the left, so to say. Basically from the right, 
happen after after the site, so to say, we're facing a phenomenon in philosophy called the new philosophers, <laughs> which are I am sorry, <laughs> and they say they were all great students of Sartre, and now they have to run away from him because Sartre is so awfully failed with basically not realizing how the, the world is going. We have those who are basically the background people behind five years of Sartre Museum, for instance, right. <laughs> made that ideology who kept him in power. So we see that fortunately it failed. <laughs> I, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, like, I, I really, I really like the digital trade I talk about. Um, <coughs> I think, uh, I think like the point that if you start um, if you start with this kind of notion of competitor of individual uh, as nature and then forget the historical relations of force that have brought that about and will continue to reproduce it, we lose track of so that's the one more central point as you reiterated by Mitsaro's there. Um, but I wonder uh, you, you make some really great examples about different uh, different ways in which we can have moralistic kind of critiques out of the system, but from the system, that kind of lose track of you know, changing the very terms of debate and really like resisting the hegemony of capitalism, which I think this whole presentation is you know, you know, um, I wonder if we can think of the examples of how there's really, I think Occupy is actually more effective about this than quite a few other movements and that they can uh, capable of turning that debate quite simply and not, you know, not with reference to incredibly alienating philosophy in terms that people can understand, because there's actually very simple ways to do that. I think 99.1% you know, has to be beautiful, and you know, CNN's using it, South Park's using it. Like, people are thinking through this lens, and all of a sudden we can think class level. I think that's, you know, we can be critical of how simplistic it is, but I think that that's a, an achievement beyond, almost beyond measure. I mean, I, just, just to hear CNN talking about class level, like, what, what are some other examples? <laughs> you go ahead. I'll go other, after you. Other examples of, uh, rephrase it. Of not just critiquing the system from the system in some moralistic, simplest, <coughs> simplest ways, but actually, you know, using very counter-hegemonic tactics. Like, I guess another example I saw was these signs that quite simply said, capitalism is the crisis. And it was like, oh, people can think that without having to you know, use bad years terminology or something, right? Well, I think I, I, get, I agree with those, uh, those examples that you give. As far as others that I can come up with, um, I, I do think that we need to also challenge people to uh, deal with some of that you know, philosophy and some of the, the, the expressions uh, that are take, take a little more intellectual struggle uh, to really get to the heart of this system. Uh, so I, I, I would tend to uh, really, you know, I appreciate and agree with you more, uh, the tremendous uh, forward motion that has occurred around the this 99 percent versus the 1 percent, you know, in America and around the world. I mean, especially if you take it to a global level, when you think of it in global terms, it's really striking because it is it is a very good example of what's happening at a global level. You know, and that 1 percent is really uh, exploiting. Vast majority of people in the world. I think that's where it makes the most sense, ultimately, so the global scale. Because you know, the vast majority of people in the world uh, are you know surviving on just very little. It's because of the capital system. But I think um, I would say uh, that we need to also wrestle intellectually with these uh, with these philosophical concepts that the Saros and others uh, really bring us. So I'm an advocate for, for physical struggle and intellectual struggle. Um, you know, I always sort of reminded by, by Marx's point that the, the proletariat, as he called it, you know, social individuals, he called it the proletariat, needs to really take on the most advanced philosophy and understand it. And <coughs> philosophy has to take on what the proletariat brings as far as social change. That's how it's going to occur. It's the most advanced theory, uh, it's the most advanced action that is going to really change the system. Um, but I don't think it can be done on a more 
um, uh, simple level because then the ideologues that appear, the, 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 the people that will take it in a direction that the majority don't want to go in because people, we need really uh, critical consciousness on a mass scale. And I think it takes more than the, 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 the simple slogans to get there. It takes intellectual struggles. I was just going to, to relate to your point, I've got, I, I gave an earlier talk like a few months ago on, and I did say like the 99% dichotomy, you know, it raises a whole bunch of issues. It's a great rhetorical term. And in terms of counter hegemonic strategies of Occupy, one that, one that the whole name or the taking Occupy or Occupation, which, you know, people don't like to be occupied, like if one country occupies another, that they don't really like that. But it's kind of like, it's twisting that around. It was occupying public space. You know, it really wasn't even occupying private space for the most part. And just the whole fact of occupying Dewey Square or Zuccotti Park or wherever it is, that, that in a sense brought people who maybe were this series you know, they were these isolated individuals, bring them together, and, bring, and almost in a sense creating that fused group. But and when and we, we would always be asked at Dewey's Fair, well, why are you here? You know, why are you t talking? It's like it's like why why aren't you doing something else to talk about this? And it's like well now you're talking about it, so it brought it raised these issues. You know, I remember also it's like the language got so appropriate at one point that during the Republican debates. Rick Perry was criticizing Mitt Romney and it's like saying like he's the one percent, like somehow Ron, like Rick Perry was the ninety-nine percent Republican. I, I don't know. But it's like just the whole physical occupation allowed for activists who may have been in the struggle a while to come you know, around, people who were not involved to come around, it allowed for events to be put on, for talks to be put on, discussions to happen. It was a great meeting point for marches, it was a great way to start with march, was to march out for many Occupy sites. So just the physical occupation itself was a great site. I do agree totally with what Irv is saying about, you know, a philosophical struggle and intellectual struggle. And I have a whole critique of the left, if you want to get into that one later. That's a slightly different topic. But I mean, in a certain sense, you know, Occupy is like this little crack and, you know, let's, I'm not, I'm just, it, it's a huge step forward. That doesn't mean there are other steps to, not to be taken, but I think it's a great step forward in just what you said, the language and the physical occupations. So, a lot of the philosophical stuff is sort of lost on me, um, nonetheless. The fundamental, things, the fundamental things that I've heard you say and that I want to hit on are, you know, the whole question of, uh, you know, the United States is based on, significantly based on this concept of individual liberties. The whole idea being behind it that if we give people liberties, they will build a society. And you're talking about the exact opposite. You're talking about taking away civil liberties so that society can control the people instead of having, you know, the, the basic, you know, basic concept of the free market is that I get to control my money, I get to control what I'm doing, and now you're telling me that that's wrong and that there's some, and the question is, who is going to control the system? Who is going to tell me what to do? And of course, I'm not going to like that. I don't want people telling me what to do. So that's why I like a free market. And of course, I like to be able to decide, make my own mistakes. And all of these things, which were you know, obviously not permitted under a communist system. And so there it is, you know. Um, democracy is the worst uh, form of government we've come up with so far, except for all the others. So what are you proposing is Well, I, I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, this issue of individual liberty um, emerges from the French Revolution. If you think back about where it started, you know, with the Enlightenment, uh, you know, that period in human history where the bourgeois were in the ascent in, in, in history. Um, and so during the uh, Enlightenment and, and really hit the rubber hit the road or the bike tire hit the road during the French Revolution. And all those ideas that had been emerging for 50 or more years with the great philosophers, uh, 
made practical expression during the French Revolution. And so individual liberty emerged out of that in the fight against the ancient regime. If you remember the clerical power and the power of the throne. And so the bourgeois emerged as a revolutionary force saying we, should, we can make history, we can change this world. And one of the things, the rights of man emerged, which is a concept of, of uh, individual really part of the concept of individual liberty. And unfortunately what happened was uh, it, had, it ran up against certain limits. If you remember in 1792, the San Colas, which were the people of the great, uh, what? The horses. The horse, yeah, the people, urban. the people, the population called for the uh, equalization of property. Uh, and that was not allowed. Uh, so the, the revolution, which was committed to uh, fraternity, equality, liberty, came up against the past. In other words, private property, even during the revolution, was reaffirmed by, by uh, certain quarters of revolutionaries. They, they would not go that far. So, so that is the beginning of the hollowing out of the rights of man and the whole uh, beginning of a, 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 a reassertion of property rights over human rights. But not to, I mean, it is to recognize that individual liberty and the, the rights of men is an important point in human development. And it opened the door, it opened the possibilities for a new understanding of humanity, which is really a more advanced state beyond the ethics of the bourgeois, which are very partial, uh, to a socialist definition of human rights which is really the, the stage we're at now. We're on the threshold of understanding that individual liberty, as was defined by the rights of man, is not adequate. It's not adequate to what we face as a world because uh, it's too partialistic. You have the right to, uh, according to individual liberty, you have the right to do what you want without somebody else getting involved, you know, and, and so the sociality is negated in this concept. Individual, the individual uh, can learn from his or her mistakes, which is very important, but to deny the sociality of everything, in other words, the social product that's created by people working together, uh, capital takes credit for that. How does it do that? Through advocating for individual liberty, which is really a misuse of liberty. There's something missing there. Uh, I believe that I should have the right to take, to employ uh, all of you in an endeavor, and, but I'm gonna take the surplus. Uh, I'm gonna be in charge. Uh, I'm providing a public service by employing you. Well, that's what I think. You know, from my perspective, I do a good service. I employ you in the test. Uh, I'm going to pay you substantially less than, uh, you know, I have to because I have to have sort of operating expenses and labor costs are part of that. Um, what do, what recourse do you have? I'm going to pay you $1.50 an hour or $1.50 a day. Uh, you have a strike option. You can band together and stop working. Uh, but because of, this is individual liberty in action, uh, I, I don't have to listen to your strike action because I, I have to obey the laws of the market. I have to keep labor costs down. So as an individual, uh, I'm trapped in this, this uh, capitalist market. And uh, so it doesn't work. Individual liberty is, 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 is too partialistic to be it on a personal level, in relation to the family, the, the head of the household, the patriarch, no longer acceptable just for the, the father to have governing principles. The feminist movement has brought in the importance of democracy in the family. So on a, on a very uh, microcosmic level, or that level, 
it doesn't work. On a macrocosmic level, it doesn't work. Obviously, from the endless wars that, that imperialism has engaged in, uh, the inability to share resources because of the global pecking order that is the result of this uh, concept of individual liberty. The U.S. is the individual sort of governor of the world from their perspective. So it has too many flaws. Tom Paine you know, made a big contribution, but it was hollowed out when, Cap when, when the bourgeois entered the descending phase, in which we're living in now. It started to occur. The descending phase of capital, you know, all social systems, all structures go through a Okay, uh, uh, let's pop back because you're, uh, I'm getting lost here. So, okay. <clears throat> I think I just agree. I think I just put it. I thought of that question. Oh, I would love to hear it. It's a really hard thing to talk about because it's on the tip of everyone's tongues and, uh, and people want to want to know that and they think you know, communism, oh, the, you know, liberty, no, and it's just, that's where we get stuck all the time. It's trying to communicate that to the public from a Marxist perspective. Um, I think. I think that my, what, what I've read you know, through Marx is that much like how he talks about money, money is came before capitalism, money will be there after. It's a useful thing. It doesn't have any meaning in itself. It's given meaning through the particular system it's in. In capitalism, it takes a particular form. And, and, but it seems like money could only be used in a capitalistic way, which is to try and split. Maybe I'll put money aside. The point is, freedom is obviously a notion which has been around forever. And under capitalism, it, it takes a particular form, which is, you know, it's not that we should reject individualized liberty because it's capitalistic. It's that when we talk about individualized liberty right now, we often, <laughs> under the, the, the so-called free market, it actually, this is what Marx is saying, is that this is a very, uh, very false notion. It's, it's, it's not that, um, as, as, as kind of listed there, when we say freedom uh, under capitalism, it often takes the very uh, uh, freedom uh, loss. Uh, they call it Lenin it. said something once: um, freedom, <laughs> freedom for who to do what? Yeah. Okay. Freedom, I think freedom for who to do what? Like, okay. If, a lovely horse to ride. If we're in the yeah. Yeah. If you look at the wage. I know you had a question. Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I got your question. But this is, this is important. What I'm trying to get at this is a really big deal. So we look at you know, you're talking about being coercive towards me. So I want to know, you know, you know, what am I going to get out of this coercion? And of coercion, of course, you know, who gets to be boss? You know, you're going to tell me what? To, are you going to be we're boss? Are you going to be boss? We're all boss. You just told. We're you, all you just told me you know, no, self management. Self management would be what we're instead of me being the boss yeah, and I mean, paying what everybody else does. We all are equal. We all get paid the same. We all contribute the same. We all are. We're all bosses here. We're, we we don't have any. We have an organization of them. I'm going to do a certain thing. You're going to do a certain thing. We have certain skills and interests, but we're not going to create a hierarchy where somebody gives somebody else orders. We're going to do it together. We meet Sunday night. So yes. there are lots of examples in the United States right now of small collectives who do stuff like that. Right. What's wrong with that? Look, they're not overturning this, this social relations. We still have imperialist scores. We still have a 1% that is extracting wealth from the 99%. Just look at yes, but, if, I mean, but I, well, the whole point of, of Occupy is, is that, you know, they're, 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 they're not obeying the social contract. They are out there. We have, have been, you know, hijacked. But it's, we're not being hijacked by capitalism. We're being hijacked by, if you will, anti-capitalism. Capitalism, the freedom of the market says, those people have to obey the same rules that the rest of us do. And when they don't, that is a perversion of the system. And so I'm, I'm protesting the perversion of the system. I want fairness. Can I say that I have to leave? So I just sure. want to. But yeah, one, that, that was sort of my concern uh, also, because it seems like uh, it's not a full answer to, to say, to put it in disjunctive terms, that we want equality, therefore liberty is a false idol. And that's the way I sort of interpreted your answer. Now, so now I, I uh, don't, I've thought about this some, and uh, my own view, and you tell me what's wrong 
with this, and also maybe yeah, note that people like Chomsky call themselves left libertarians. Maybe explain that a little bit. Uh, but I think there's a core that is uh, essential, as libertarians say, of self ownership. And the question is self ownership of what? So uh, I would say, for example, that taxation, redistribution, ownership of the means of production, collective ownership, all of that is perfectly consistent with self-ownership on the things that uh, you're entitled to, to be a self-owner of, which is basically your personality, your body, and uh, your thoughts. Um, so I accept the libertarian idea of self-ownership. I just don't accept the idea that it applies to everything we ever produced and that it applies to freedom of contract and of the main taxation. But I'm a little concerned that uh, there isn't a place for this idea of self-ownership in what you are saying. And let me just, uh, to give you an example, this is sort of what attracted me to this little nub of libertarianism that I said, is um, the example that I thought a lot about and wrote uh, Sunstein, you know, the uh, Harvard Law Professor is now in the uh, Obama administration wrote an article saying, if more lives would be saved by the death penalty than are taken by the death penalty through deterrence, that um, we are obligated, morally obligated, to have a death penalty because uh, the state has an obligation to prevent the loss of life, just as it has an obligation not to kill. And if the balance is, if you prevent more loss of life by killing some, it, it must. And the only answer to that that I can think of is that we own our bodies and that the state doesn't have any right to take them away. So what what's the do you accept that? And if not, what is the alternative? Do you just say there is no such thing as self-ownership, we all just have to exist for the good of the whole? Or would you say there is uh, some idea that you know, we need certain individual liberties to trump the collectivity? I think that the because of the historic moment we're in, it's difficult to uh, see that individual liberty is a phase of human development in which we're moving toward a greater freedom. In other words, self-ownership, the ultimate self-ownership, or a more, a more uh, uh, thorough expression of self-ownership would be actually worker control, self-management, community control. But why do you do that disjunctive again? Yeah, you're saying because, and I agree with support for ownership, work of self management, but I don't see why that displaces or is in tension with individual self ownership that trumps on certain civil liberties. Freedom of uh, thought, freedom of. Well, they would be included in those concepts. I mean, I mean to, to be an equal at work, to be recognized as a contributor to the economy. As a, uh, here would be uh, there's no reason why uh, that would abrogate my individual expression of what I think is really important in what we do. Uh, you know, there's no contradiction to uh, self ownership when in fact all of us as selves are see each other as equal. So, but why then? Why not accept and embrace the idea of? certain civil liberties uh, in which the individual from the collective to the degree that it's, that it's appropriate. As I'm saying, you know, there's a, a range of things where I think self-ownership is the only idea that we get across that the state or the majority or the majority interest can't interfere with certain things. In fact, they can't take out a kidney, even though you can survive with only one kidney in order to let other people live, right? So now maybe you are utilitarian enough to say, uh, no, there should be, uh, you know, people with two eyes should be donating an eye to the blind uh, or forced to. But uh, there's a certain nub, as I say, of libertarian sense uh, that says, uh, no, that's a violation of human dignity. Well, uh, maybe a way to talk about it would be more of the subject, the subject of uh, the human being an expression of uh, the, the historic, the new historic form. Uh, uh, 
would not deny the individual part of the social individual. You're seeing, you seem to imply, from what I've said, I'm giving you the wrong impression, that somehow in this, in this concept of the social individual, the social is dominant rather than what we have now with individual and we have capitalism, the individual is dominant, subjectivity is dominant, and the objectivity is, is not dealt with. So you seem to think that this would become unbalanced in a way where when you become public, people are the social uh, would dominate us as yes. individuals. And this is the danger. Um, so this is this I don't think would happen if in fact we have control of the economy in our in our daily life, if we engage in self-management, that possibility of the uh, collective dominating the individual would, would, would not happen. It wouldn't be acceptable. There has to be but let, me, but let me just ask, do you, do you accept any conception of a right to self-ownership at all or not? Well, the way, you're, the way you use the term, I think of it as the social individual. Uh -huh. That to me is, is what you're saying. Um, from what I understand, how you... How well, but you if you take the death penalty example, so... Uh, if more people, uh, if, if it could be shown that the deterrent value of the death penalty is 10 to 1, so every time there's an execution, 10 murders aren't going to happen, just as a thought experiment, and I know that's not the fact. But if that were the case, which would you come down with that? You know, and to me, the only answer to say no, if that's what you sort of believe pre-reflectively, is the self-ownership idea. Of your body. Well, I, I see. I think it brings up that brings up so many things about the state as a, its negative role in human development. The very the very idea of taking life, you know, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or whatever, um, the revenge. Um, you know, I think the role of the state is part of its effort to to, to act as as a mediator between classes and so on, between the have-nots and the haves. This, this comes up, but uh, you know, I don't think there should be a death penalty. I mean, and, and in a, a rationally ordered society, there would be less need for it. We, would, we wouldn't have the largest prison population in the world if, in fact, uh, there wasn't this cleavage between those who have and those who do not. Uh, if there was more equality, uh, you have less crime. Uh, here we have a dramatic difference between those who uh, so you're talking pragmatically rather than have a principle here. Well, you're saying this is what will happen, actually. Well, and I'm just saying, well, is there some principle which does reserve a place for uh, the individual uh, sovereignty that remains immune from state interference? Yeah, I think, I, think I, I see that the develop, development of some sort of more rational social form would automatically bring us there, that, that self-ownership, that you can't, the, the ultimate expression of self-ownership is self-management. In other words, I take responsibility for what's happening in Iraq, I take responsibility, you know, I'm taking responsibility for uh, changing the world, uh, being active in the movement, that is an expression of someone who is self-ownership. They're not being uh, dependent upon Oh, I agree with that. State I agree, or, I agree with that, but again, I don't. I think it's sort of disjunctive, to what you do. It's unnecessarily disjunctive. But I mean, I'm sorry, I have to go in a couple of minutes. But I appreciate. The, I, I really appreciate your point, and, and, and uh, we need to talk more. Well, thank you. I'm going to go in, in a couple of minutes. Well, so my apologies. Thank you for raising it. Anyone have any other questions? I did have something I want to say, but if someone. I mean, I, I just I really like that. I think that I think that it's something that I find is, is really hard to address, and I think that we have to be able to communicate. I, I happen to really agree with you guys that I think the free market, you know, this very notion of the free market, you know, frames frames personal ownership. And, and it's not like it's not like we're ever going to not. Have that. I mean, it's. I, 
think we need to be able to, to answer that question because it's a question that a lot of people have in how, how can we talk about, from a Marxist perspective, you know, what is like the ultimate critique of the notion of freedom within the free market? How, how can we you know, offer a freedom from a Marxist perspective, which is obviously there because, as you said, freedom is an adjective. It's, it's, uh, it's open to... Uh, no, it's OK. We're trying to work through our head. This is what we have to deal with like, from a Marxist perspective. If you want to live over people, and, and not just like, through an ideology of Marxism, but uh, I was just, the I was just going to say, I, and I mean this in, a, of course, the friendly spirit. We're all here. But I believe that the abuses, the crises, and everything are not a perversion of capitalism. They are intrinsic to its very nature. Capitalism is based on the exploitation of labor. That's how capital, it, when we work for a wage, it seems like we're getting a fair equivalent. We pick up our paycheck and we you know, get what we need and everything. But collectively, the uh, workers in a particular business, they are creating not just their own wage, their own money that they use to buy their necessities. They're creating a surplus that is expropriated, that is extracted from them by the owner, by the capitalist class. And I believe that is the very intrinsic nature of capitalism. And those businesses need to profit to expand. So if it's more profitable to not sell food to hungry people, why not do it? If it's more profitable to bomb the hell out of somebody so you can establish a genome there and you can extract those resources, why not? And I believe that, for instance, capitalism is not some pristine system. It is not some. It, you're not going to get rid of the corporate greed, and it's going to be good. It is based on the exploitation. That's in its genetic code. And if we look at just the history, that capitalism, it's, capitalism is intrinsic with racism, colonialism. And there are different forms of capitalism. I'm going to say right now, I think a Swedish-style capitalism is better than this one. But it's still capitalism. And capitalism, of course, you know, let's, uh, here's another I believe in this capitalist system. I don't believe it's a democracy necessarily fully. I believe it's a democracy for the ruling class. Ultimately, they get to decide amongst themselves what they do. And we can maybe put in a ballot box which one of them we want to have misrepresent us every few years. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not certain liberties that have been won through various struggles, through various popular actions. But when there are transgressions against the capital frame, when there are transgressions against those social relations. But by that I mean popular struggle. Unions in this country, if you look at the labor history, Haymarket, Pullman, the 1930s, if you look at anti-war movements that question the modus operandi, they get put down, they get struck back by the state. The state is there to protect those relations. Now sometimes we say, well, the state's punishing this particular capitalist for their transgressions. The state exists to maintain the whole cohesive of the state of the system against any one particular record member of the ruling class. So if someone is polluting so much that it's not only polluting workers' neighborhoods or poor people or minorities, which in general the system doesn't really care about, but if it's say affecting the upper class, or maybe if it is affecting the poor communities and it's doing such a way that they're starting to get agitated, they're gonna to want to put a stop to that. And they will punish them. It may not be, you know, it may be a fine, it may be jail or whatever, but the state will exist to, to maintain social cohesion. So we can make various reforms in the system at times, depending on the particular situation. But I believe it's ultimately a way for the state exists to maintain a certain amount of pro a certain system of property relations that currently exist. And there have been different versions of the capital state. They can have a constitutional monarchy. You can have a, a bourgeois democracy. And of course, you can have fascism, which ultimately maintains capitalist relations against a rising working class. Well, in the two of the go ahead. I, I just, you know, to know the state does not exist for those purposes. The state exists because we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, union Etc. Etc. It is to be a state of the people, for the people, and by the people. And 
where that isn't happening is it's a perversion of the state. It's a perversion of what this country was founded for. And you know, the greatest war this country ever fought was to overturn the, the, the what we inherited from the Brits and from, from the uh, uh, French. The Civil War was a battle against what we inherited from the imperialists. And we won that war, and now we're struggling with the difficulty of integrating back into a racist society that always existed, and God knows why. And people have certainly exploited us all the time on those issues. But fundamentally, you know, um, what was Kennedy's address to Amherst? You are the people who have been blessed by this country with your responsibility. So, you know, when I hear you talking and saying the opposite, you, know, you see I get upset. Not that the state doesn't do bad things, but the state exists for we the people. Can we maybe, like, maybe we can find some common ground here, because I, I, I completely think it's like, in, in, in Marx's language, we speak of the state that way. But I think, that, and I understand your, your problem with that, maybe we can think of the state. When, when, when he's saying that, um, I've read this too, and I got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Same case. Let's think about it economically. I think, you know, in terms of a system of governments, an equal state, that people come together, and, you know, that's that's not something that we should distort, and that's not something we can distort because people are on board with that. Right? That's, you know, that's the common sense right now that reigns. What we're what trying to say is that economically, you know, this notion of the free market, the state, the state has to. Uh, who, who this system of governments is actually you know, truly representing economically under capitalism is uh, a small group of people who are you know, privy to surplus, which means, you know, in layman's terms, there's people who get the profit from the wider, you know, from the, the wider organizations, and people who don't. They just get paid. But what the what, what this system of governments, when it just represents you know, the reason we say the system of governments just represents, you know, the elite few, one percent, the, the bourgeois, the people who get profit, is what that means. Um, the reason we say that is because at the end of the day, those who are not privy to profit, which is us, um, we are getting, um, perhaps I don't want to jump in. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, Take your time. Well, no, that's fine. Yeah, We're having I, a discussion. I, I, I think we should think about you know when we say the state is ultimately doing this, it's because economically the free market is designed to continuously push for the rights of a very small few to get more profits and degrade and degrade you know the amount of money workers get, and that's what that's what okay. these those prices no, are, no. and so that's what we need to overthrow is that is that sort of relations in which. We need fewer getting more and more profit, and the rights of workers getting pushed down in the name of competition and profitability. And other states are in competition with it. And it just, it's this hamster wheel we're all running on. And we think of the free market as, as you know, our savior of freedom. But in fact, like, you know, all, all, all it is is, an, you know, is an economic apparatus that thinks of us as numbers. And a lot of us are becoming, you know, it thinks of us as numbers in terms of how much money we have oh, and get from. Oh, come, come on, nothing. We're, we're anthropomorphizing stuff way too much. Okay, and it's, we're, we're, it's a useful you know, analytic. You're right, we do that. They, they, we need to work past it. But it's, it's useful to think about. That yeah. there is what happens and perversions of the system and dominations by people who shouldn't be able to dominate, who are perverting the system. And that's what, that's what I'm struggling against. And there are versions of different systems, you know, and, um, you know. Well, maybe maybe uh, the discussion is yeah. from my point of view, uh, again, goes back to existentialism, right? It goes back to two possibilities. One possibility is that, that possibly, what I'm listening to what you're saying, uh, it is, uh, there's a way to, to reform the system or not to, to avoid the state where the possibilities of the power system can, can keep them clean, so to say. And the other argument is that you can't do that. 
<laughs> it's just this basic thing. And whenever you have a state, one side says we are going to go to third grade. You say, no, we can keep it clean according to higher principles, fundamental principles in the Constitution or so. Yeah. And this is what I got from today's discussion. And this is a basic and existential argument. Maybe I see it as wrong because it involves the fact that, that it goes bad, that is more or less something existential. It goes bad, or it does not go bad if I can keep it clean. You know, and that, that's the two things here. Mm -hmm. Can I keep it clean or can I not? I mean, it's basically a thing of life, how it goes. Is it a limit to that? And it's not a limit to that. It won't make what difference the system is that battle will always be there. Yeah. It will always exist and we will always struggle. But there's one point where, where if you get a partiality, it's, there's going to be problems. If everybody's involved as much as possible in the decision-making process, you have to actually substantive democracy rather than formal democracy. The formal democracy was individual liberties about. We want to move forward to substantive democracy, which would be Everybody's involved in decisions that affect their lives. Everybody's involved. Uh, that's the only way, as Mark said, the economy is going to work. If you have uh, some partial group running the show, they're going to try to take it in a certain particular direction, which they think makes them more money or whatever. It's only when you have democracy that it works. That's when it will work, when we're all thinking about it together, doing what we can, then, then it works. And that's what the next stage is for humanity. We've gone through sort of these partial attempts, you know, corporate control, state control, uh, so on and so forth. They didn't work. We know that. The church used to control us, right? But this is a transition, but humanity's moving forward to a higher state of freedom. And that's what, that's what the socialism is. It's where socialism is actually the social process where we make decisions together as equals rather than having Donald Trump or whoever's up there, you know, these characters emerging and they're sort of setting the tone, the media doing their bidding, the tremendous ideological power of the media to create a sort of confusion. Uh, all of this is, is really uh, something that we went through and it's been wrong since the French Revolution. And the inadequacy, the inadequacy of this uh, rights of man, it's, it's, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, I, I, I'm certainly not seeing it. And of course, I guess the ultimate question at the end of the day, which is the same question that everybody has to answer, is how many people are you willing to kill to get your way? How many people are currently being killed under this system? It's quite a lot. No, how many people are you willing to kill? Like you willing to kill? I'm just, but I'm saying, just to maintain the system is like an incredible body count. That's what is destructive about it. Yeah, why, do, why does it, the issue of violence, you know, obviously we're in favor of non-violence. Non-violence is the most rational way to solve it. From the capitalist system that you're, you're trying to defend here is endless wars, military budgets that are out of control, destroying the economy because all this money is going into all these deadly wars, the, the nuclear arms race. We get that from this 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 particular we are all created by the imbalance of the system. But that is the same question. Any How many system people are you willing to kill to get your way? I mean, that was the question of the French Revolution. That was the question of the American Revolution. You should Revolution. also understand. What are you willing to well, kill people never come to the it's also that's a that's Venezuela the wrong question. It's, a, it's the wrong question, Bill. The question what is the wrong question? It's, it's you are talking about violently overthrowing no, people. No, no, no. no, 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 no. That's sure what I heard. I'm not trying to disagree with that. Because I think that's what's so powerful <laughs> occupies it by structures where people can kind of try to like redefine words. And obviously we're, we're struggling with the notion of state here. And also I like stuff. But I think I think like when we're talking when when he says like well, the state system doesn't work, like I, I, and you're saying, well, what was the deal? It was so beautiful with the Civil War, and you're right. Like, like it was, it was a group of people saying, we, we, we reject that partiality, we leave that class, or, or that, you know, that group that's, that's, you know, it's, that's going against the will of this collective at this moment, right? And if we're getting so caught on the part, you know, the word state, like, 
we can call this new system of, of representation the state if we want to, because that's not really the point. We're, we're talking about a more democratic way to organize and redistribute money. And personal freedoms, you know, they're there either way, and it's, they're not trying to infringe on that. It's it's simply, you know, for me at least, it's quite simply economically what happens in as it confuses people in thinking their freedom lies in you know, their ability to, to work in a particular job and spend the money as they wish. And I don't think this, this change would take away from that, it would take away from the, the profit motive for, for state governments, which has you know, continuously you know, convinced people that the only way they can be represented is through this push for competition against each other and against other communities. And we shouldn't be thinking that way. And, I reject violence, and I reject even the social overthrowing because it involves you know, a collective against another collective. And perhaps with the one percent, you know, there is, it's maybe an ideological struggle. But you know, I think Occupy has been great because it hasn't stumbled over these ideological words, which we shouldn't. And we're, we're, we are trying to work together because we agree with the same things. <laughs> maybe that's just a really blase way to try to. But uh, I think those are. Anyway, right, thank you. Well, thank you. Good <laughs> work. So, so, so. Anything else? Oh, I, I think. No, I'm not in five minutes. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. thank you very much. And it was informative and interesting, and I have things to think about.